This is PodKit, episode 37, 10X Criminal, on March 25th, 2018. And now, Natch. This episode of PodKit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersant. This episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk37. Hello, hello. How's it going? It's going well. It's been a while. As, as it is every time. <laughs> <laughs> truly, truly. But this week, we're all in studio together. It's a rare occasion. IRL. So our reactions will be so much more snappy. Well, exactly. you, you know, I think I think we probably did like, like our first meetup together was at the U around this time of year. That's true. Three years ago? I don't know how many yeah. years ago yeah, that was. 2015. This is, uh, yeah, 2015. So PodKit. The, the, at least uh, the idea of it, right? Right. Yeah. Did yeah. we record an episode that day? No, I don't no. think so. Because yeah. we were at the U. Yeah. Right. Well, we, we could have just captured the, the sounds of... Did we train. eat at Wally's that day? We, we did. did eat at Wally's, which was a good choice. We should do that again sometime. Yeah. There's a there's a place um down the street from here on Selby yeah. that kind of uh, sells food like Wally's. Oh, for real? Yeah. Where'd you go sometime? It's kind of like the F. Randy place that closed at Abdul's. Yeah. But, but you know, different place. Yeah. 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 Gotcha. Highly recommend it. Mm, food. <laughs> Right. Food is very good. I've peed on hummus in my backpack. See, for all of the like, listeners who uh, wanted to enjoy their second food podcast of the day, <laughs> of course, their other food podcast is Control Structure. I see, oh. yes. Well, of course. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely the Lynn Rosetto Casper of, uh, uh, <laughs> of this podcast, so, uh, I'll, you know, I, the, yeah. I yeah. Know. There's a, there's a, there was a joke there and I lost it. It's the Splendid Table. I'm Lynn Rosetto Casper. Must be a. Uh, when does that show air? Is that a, is that like a Sunday weekend show? Yep, exactly. So I'm like that's the exact mood I'm getting right now. Yep, yep, yep. We're recording on a Sunday, by the way. This is true. What do we normally do? Mondays. Mondays. Mondays yeah. Mondays usually. Sometimes Thursday, maybe. <laughs> Monday. Monday. Thursday. So a day of the week. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So days ending in Y. Usually <laughs> we, we we tend to record on those. Yes, but this see, is that, true. I wonder. So I don't. Yeah, no, in other languages, days don't necessarily end in Y. That's true. Or any uniform letter. So. That's true. It's just an English thing. Yeah. Uh, I think in Danish, it's all uh, D-A-G. Hmm. Is so. that... Uh, what? Yeah, that's, that's true. That's cheating. Well, and it's probably also like a shared linguistic thing, too. I think so. Like, English probably well, for a lot got of it, it from, from like, Nordic languages, right? Yeah. For, yeah, for you know, European, yeah. Latin-based, it's probably pretty similar anyway we should talk about tech stuff shouldn't we that's what this podcast is about we should and make sure we have a serious topic to begin with today i know this is a rare thing for us here because normally it's about react or some other irrelevant topic don't worry there will be lots of talk about react as well that's right but but to begin we're going to talk about everybody's favorite thing encryption on phones this, this this again so um this is an article here from the uh, our good friends at the New York Times. Yep, very very good uh, good good article about the FBI and Justice Department again pushing um, for some kind of access to phones that have been encrypted in some way. Yeah. Now over the past I don't know five ish years when uh, since iPhones have been encrypted by default and increasingly Androids right Android phones have been encrypted by default. There's been you know discussion and talking about a way for our U.S. government to at least be able to unlock a phone, yep. maybe not themselves, maybe by themselves, but some way, maybe with cooperation of the vendor, but some way. Um, and so I, I have some uh, snippets that I found amusing and I tweeted the other day, um, and it's too hard to read the article again, so I will just pull my snippets up, because <laughs> um, that's how uh, reading works. So the idea is that when devices encrypt themselves, they would generate a special access key that could unlock their data without the owner's passcode. This electronic key would be stored on the device itself inside part of its hard drive that would be separately encrypted so that only the manufacturer, in response to a court order, could open it. I love that my phones have hard drives in them now. Well, yeah, I know, right? But, you know, the New York Times has to write it in the a particular know, common de- voice. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Common, the common denominator lingo. Yep. Um, so what do you think of that? Like, do you, do you feel like that seems sort of suspect? Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. Like, another component of it, too, is that, like, you know, maybe maybe you can kind of, you know, let, let's say for a second you throw out the concerns about having a key that can unlock your phone that 
you don't have access to but somebody else does mm-hmm. let's let's throw that out the window for a second like eventually you know on an infinite time scale mm-hmm. uh the um we're going to have sufficient computing power to break the encryption of that thing mm-hmm. so you just have a latent a latent, a latent breach breach yeah, yeah exactly yeah. um and you know some some could argue then you know if on an infinite time scale too you could also break the encryption that's encrypting your encryption but i think yeah, right yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's like uh but simultaneously too you're you're kind of at a point where um you know when you when you bake something into the device that is solely there to unlock it that kind of feels worse it it does it feels a lot worse it gives the impression of security mm-hmm. right 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 when it really you know leaves a maybe not a door but a, a very thin wall that can be broken into quite easily right it's 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 like you have two filing cabinets and you lock the key from one filing cabinet and the other filing cabinet and then leave the other filing cabinet open and just kind of assume that if somebody finds if somebody knows enough to find the key they were probably permitted they were probably yeah, permitted. yeah totally fine yeah. i mean it's like when i give you guys the the code to the house like if you know it you're permitted yeah. i still don't know it oh my god <laughs> i don't think i've ever written it down that's so bad <laughs> Hey, I, well, I went like two miles north I'm, today before I got here. I'm, I'm so if I gave you the code, memory. it would be reversed and upside down. This is true. The uh, <laughs> the, the fun thing uh, about security or the best security, right, is secure from oneself. <laughs> That's true. So I, I um, when I was in at the U in school in one of yeah. the ethics classes, the um, the 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 case where they were trying to unlock some terrorist's iPhone yep. something. Um, that was going on, and so I wrote some paper about it, and so I've always been sort of attached to this in- phone encryption topic. You know, I I just, I don't, it's, it's we're replaying what we tried in the 90s, sort of. Totally. So um, back then, the B- Bill Clinton administration tried to do this thing called key escrow, mm-hmm. which was when you encrypted something, it would generate another key, and guess what it would do? It would store it for the government's usage. Cool, great. Um, how secure is that these days if that were implemented how they they spec'd it out i i have no i i don't think they actually ever got any any anything like it yeah. didn't work it's not possible yeah right yeah well there's that other kind of component to this too um of like using export export permitted ciphers or whatever right, of export course class ciphers when you submit to the app store yeah you have to make sure that you're not exporting arms right right and that's just like yeah like like the the idea of that is kind of like equal parts understandable and bonkers right right because like i I get why you wouldn't want to trans transmit data that is um proprietary or maybe of interest to Mm -hmm. one government or another um uh in an encrypted fashion but also of course i want to do that Mm -hmm. (laughs) right like why why would i want my thing to be visible to other people that's like the point of why it's encrypted so to use something that is you know shall we say um like flawed by design Mm -hmm. so that just so that i can you know submit it to the app store for example right that just seems backwards Mm -hmm. and so on twitter what i what i kind of said about this was that we're optimizing for the wrong audience here yeah so like a lot of this talk about phone encryption kind of boils down to um you know pursuing criminals terrorists or these other imaginary semi-imaginary issues yeah um instead of optimizing for the general case of somebody stealing your phone and trying to get data off of it to exploit your identity right which seems like it happens more probably yeah i'm guessing absolutely yeah so the the final quote that i have here from my uh from the article but one justice Department official familiar with the deliberations contended that it might not be necessary to come up with a foolproof system arguing that a solution that would work for ordinary, less savvy criminals was still worth pursuing. So we're going to do all this. We're still not going to get a system that's good. <laughs> and we've all been reduced to now the same level as ordinary, less savvy criminals. Nice. That's the best way to insult your population. It's my right. favorite. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, going after someone who is of a threat, you know, don't that's kind of the end the end solution or the end game of what's going on try to prevent all this from happening in the beginning so like right kind of getting a little political here mm. with uh gun control instead of 
arming teachers take away the guns so people can't or um, help fix society problems so people are there less, you go now are we're less focusing on the right thing prone to do what they are trying to prevent right now right, right. these laws so when i when i read ordinary less savvy criminal i think wow man i really want to strive to be a 10x criminal <laughs> <laughs> uh so good <laughs> because yeah i mean if if people know that these can be broken into they're just going to find another way of doing it and so right. well and that's what, exactly what's going to happen and then you know? everyone's going to suffer at that because everyone's going to be less secured right well and so then all of the phone vendors that you know so apple will have this magic back door and android phones will have the magic back door but then there will still be this set of phones that you can order from china that ironically have a chinese back door right but that don't have the u.s back door right and and so then what then then all of the law enforcement still can't get what they wanted but then the, 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 the second slippery slope after this one, the, the cliff, I guess, is that so the U.S. gets what they want and they can unlock all the phones they want. But then what about the other 175 countries in the world? <laughs> yeah. Do you, you think they're not going to come knocking on that very thin wall? They will. Yeah. And so if the U.S. has some secret encryption section in the secure enclave, yep. pretty sure the other five major governments that have infinite computing power are going to try to brute force them too. Or maybe there's a government that says, no, that's stupid. They, they, no backdoor for us. Turn it off. Yeah. And then, and then they have, then every device maker has to make a version that's more secure anyway. Right. And then people are going to try to buy that version. And then, oh, well, it's going to be an illegal import. What, yeah. Yeah. What if instead it's like a, it's like a, a, a backdoor to the backdoor that oh kills gosh. the backdoors. That'd be wonderful. <laughs> and then, yeah, eventually you like, you know, five ten years you look at the uh, storage usage data on your phone and it's like 10, 10 gigabytes for <laughs> backdoor yeah prevent. it's like the ad blocker blockers yeah exactly exactly yeah. it's a it's a it's a decoy 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 hard drive yep. yes yeah. <laughs> there you go. so goofy so i guess that's that's that was our serious topic now it's time for some uh, react and not serious topics yeah so about a week ago maybe um there was a sudden surprise redesign to our favorite website, NPM. Nice. Um, and so I, I found this tweet from one of the people who presumably work at the NPM, and they kind of go over some of the uh, tech they used to do that uh, redesign. And I thought it was just interesting to notice the tech they used and um, you know appreciate that they did some cool stuff. Yeah, totally. Um I actually just noticed that uh, NPM uh, kind of launched this UI refresh like Friday. Basically, mm -hmm. Friday is when yeah. I noticed it. Um, and at first, at first, it was kind of just like, "Oh, I wonder if I'm like A/B testing something mm -hmm. for somebody." And then, I, and then I noticed that it wasn't, and it was just real. Um, so that was kind of cool. Uh, it looks like they they've already kind of uh, they've already kind of. Uh, built in some features that definitely kind of uh brighten up the interface a little bit from where it was before oh yeah i see a mix of vector and non-vector images on their website oh well that'll happen um you know it's kind of tabbed more like github mm -hmm. um one thing that i realized is that i was having some difficulty getting to the repository like yeah for certain things because it used to have the full like github.com slash slug yeah i think and now it just says repository github.com right yeah and like I, I think just visually, it took that's that was the first cue for me that mm -hmm. something had changed. Yeah, is when I tried to look for the for the repo or yep. for the code link, and it just was like, wait, what? Well, I guess that that for, I knew it changed because of the tweets, but that's when I realized I didn't like that part of the change. <laughs> right, right. Um, but I, I I like what they did here with some of their tech. Um, so they used uh, Webpack, of course, with Babel. Yep. I have never heard of notch or natch or oh what uh, is this i think natch is a abbreviation for naturally is that what is that oh, oh it's not a real thing it's oh. just like it's like and and babble naturally oh yeah. oh my gosh oh, okay. you hipsters and your fake words i know i don't natch. I, I don't say that for huh. exactly that reason but i asked somebody what it was and they were like oh it means naturally no and way I'm like how how could it pot there's no c in naturally um, okay. There's, there's there's barely there's certainly not an H in naturally. I'm just very confused now. Um, 
Naturally spelled N A T C H U R L A R Y L Y. Just letters. Yeah. Just, yeah. Uh, they used React, of course, naturally. Uh, um, they used Redux for some of the um, interior logged in pages that need to maintain state, of course. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. They used um, a CSS library called Tachyons. I've heard um, of that. Which I had never really used. Yeah, me neither. But I've heard of people using it. Um, it's a CSS library. What'd you expect? Um, they use CSS modules, which is sort of one of those um, CSS and JavaScript solutions that everybody loves these days. Um, I have never heard of a spife. Any any ideas on a spife? Or spifer rack? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I should look that up because I it's, do not know it's what it a, is. It's a JS HTTP based micro framework. What is a micro frame? Oh, okay. oh, that's probably used. I get it for their. It's for the back end, most likely. Yeah. Well, API. it's the back end front end because I'm sure the real API is busy actually doing real work. I sincerely can't find a link to this, whatever it is. Is it a, is it an npm package? Yeah, here I'll put a link on the notes for you. Okay. S- maybe it's Spiffy or is it Spife? I'm not sure. I I think like Spife Rack is like a a pun on Spice Rack. Okay. So I think. Huh. Oh, oh! <laughs> Welcome to Spife. It cuts like a knife, but scoops like a spoon. That makes no sense to me Jeez. whatsoever. <laughs> uh... So, so I guess what what I love about the 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 JavaScript ecosystem is you can just make up a word and then make up a slogan that doesn't need to make sense. It just has to be words together. Yeah, it, it <laughs> relates. It relates to nothing whatsoever. <laughs> oh, oh! This is made by npm. Oh well, of course it is. That that's intriguing. They probably made it for this. Probably. Um, so then they use Joy, which is everybody's favorite uh, object validator. They use the recently announced npm CI, which is the new npm continuous integration service that I have not looked into at all. Me either. Uh, they use Jest and Tap and NYC. Don't know what those two things are. I know Jest. NYC is another test thing. Okay. Yeah, I've used it a little bit, but it works with Karma or something like that. Okay, know. so it's one of those things. And then, of course, Sentry. Karma and Jest are different. I don't know. Sentry is really going to be important for them because of all of their downtime this year. What is Sentry? Uh, Sentry is a, an error reporting, error aggregation service. Okay. It's kind of like, um, what's one of the sponsors of Track that? JS. Yeah. Kind of like TrackJS, but mm, maybe like um, they, they target a broader audience but do the same kind of stuff. More Silicon Valley startup-y? No, like, instead of just tracking JS, they track errors in any code, really. Okay. So is it like a... If your language can ha- catch exceptions, you can use Sentry. Oh, these oh interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so you, like, post things to that directly, and it's you can, just a... You, you could, um, but also, like, so in JavaScript, of course, you can just you can just tell Sentry, like, hey, modify the error prototype, and if anybody throws one, log it. Yeah. yeah. Um, can't do that in Java, which is good, but if you could... <laughs> Uh, Sentry would be there. Yeah, yeah. It it, it looks like it'll it'll kind of hook into anything you want. It looks like kind of a hybrid of TrackJS yeah. and like Splunk, maybe a yeah. little bit. Yep. Um, but you would need to use Log4j, right? If you wanted to use it in Java, yeah. Because there's no monkey patching no, prototypes, which aren't we lucky for? <laughs> Can you imagine monkey patch prototypes in the Java? That would be. Uh, it'd be like putting the Ava before the Jaw, and yeah. it'd be Ava. Yeah. I'll just take this second on monkey patching to promote last month's javascript mn talk um fantastic you should totally watch it was that only last month i think it was yeah that was uh, uh, what was the to- what was the topic called uh but he covered about how you can't trust h- h- yeah how to detect uh bad third parties on your page by uh charlie Vazak. i, I think that? i think the, the the general the gist of that is if there's a third party in your page they're probably not good yeah right yeah I'll, I'll plop a link to that. And it's a miracle that anything works. It is a miracle that anything works still. This is true. Um, so well, Brandon is doing some linking. Let's talk about um, the shattering of the React Foundation. I mean, can you feel the suspense? Was this the stuff a few weeks ago about Redux and context and things like that? Uh, no. Related but distinct. <laughs> it kind of came across in the same instant, even though it's a different... This is around thing. JSConf Iceland, right? Yeah. Yeah. So so a few weeks ago, you linked, I don't know if it was in Slack or Twitter or somewhere, I don't yep. know, um, but you kind of had like a like a cal- month calendar chart, yeah. and you had like 
big tent pole topic in the first three, yep. and then you're like, oh, I hate what's coming next. Um, and and I and I love that visualization because it's exactly how the React community is right now. Like yep. it's it's some hype thing for a month, and I'm like, okay, we're moving on to the next one. We we got as many, yep. you know, four minute tutorial videos as we could about this topic. We're moving on. Yep, exactly. Um, so a few weeks ago, 24 days ago, according to this article from Hacker News, um, Dan Abramov is one of the guys that works on sort of, he made Redux, of course, but he also works on React Now. Yeah. He, and he's kind of one of the one of the big four yeah. prophets of JavaScript, as it were. Oh, that's terrifying. And I, I say that with, uh, with you know, drip, dripping with uh, sarcasm. Not suspense? Uh, well, maybe that too, but mostly <laughs> sarcasm. Yeah. Um, and so there's a, a nice video that you can watch that kind of goes into um, the lack of detail, I guess, on how it works. Um, but luckily, I can tell you how it works because somebody posted here on Hacker News um, a summary of tweets made by Andrew Clark, who also works on React yep. and stuff. So leading up to this, Dan and his friends on the Twitter were being intentionally vague and suspenseful about this new feature and it was really annoying because he had kept sharing it to other people widening that circle so right. like then ryan florence got it and yep. then the partner of ryan florence whose name is something. probably also, the other guy yeah either florence i think his first name's florence yeah um and so like there's just there's just ton, there was a ton of people talking about this thing that nobody knew what it was yeah and so then um at at uh jscon iceland um he explained Explained what they were, and of course, one of those things was async rendering, but it was really called time slicing or something. Yeah, that wasn't the, the interesting part, really. I think we all kind of knew that async rendering was coming because of React right. 16.3's inclusion of async rendering. Right. So that was a given. But the real big one was called React Suspense. Dun dun dun. Oh. Um, <gasps> yeah. So what it is is a way to. Um, build into sort of the the react grammar or the react syntax the react the reactness put the put the part of loading something into it yep make loading a first class state sort of in the tree of what react covers for you right um and when you think of it that way it's really cool because what have you always had to do with your data you had to make a uh, a state key yep. called loading thing yep whatever the thing was you know it could be could yeah. be chickens. It could be. It could be. Wow, chickens! That covers like half the table. Everything, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it could be. It could be whatever it is. And so, and then loading thing, and then you either have a true or false, or maybe you want to be fancier and you have a multi-state variable. Yep. Um, and then you can toggle your UI based on what state it's in. You can have a spinner. You could actually show the content. You could show an air screen. You could show this is taking a while. Yep. Um, but what if you could do all of that? By just making a request, not caring really specially about it, yep. and letting the render function just do whatever it needs to do to accommodate it. Yep. Wow, like what a what a cool idea. And then even better is prevent the rendering of other trees based on that yep. state. Um, and so that's what suspense does. And so we have here how it works sort of at a high level. Um, in the render method, you read a value from the cache, and there's just some kind of, it, it could be a global cache, it could be a cache local to the component, yep. you can do whatever you need to do. If the value's in the cache, render like normal. Yep. If the value isn't in the cache, you don't throw an error, yep. you throw a promise. And this is where the key insight was that somebody had to abuse yeah. a language construct. <laughs> So when you throw the promise, uh, you that that promise would have your Ajaxy kind of thing in it or whatever you need to do. That's a lot of work that could yep. take a while. When that promise resolves, though, React will resume where it left off in that render method. Yep. So it'll prevent the rendering from that render method down. So if you do at a high enough level, the children won't render. And then when it does get the data that it needed, it will resume its rendering. It's and and then if you watch the video, it's. Actually, really cool what he shows off. Now, in the 24 days since, we haven't really gotten a whole lot out of him. Right. Um, Ryan Florence made something, and then Dan yelled at him and made him take it down. Right. That was pretty funny. Why, um, why did that happen? 
apparently, um, the React team didn't want anybody to make a library too soon after the talk because the API could change and it might scare people into thinking that this is the fun- this is the this is the way to think about it okay. too soon. Yeah. This is why I refer to Dan Abramov as one of the four prophets of <laughs> of the React world because he likes to have a he likes to have control over yeah. the information about things in well, ways but, that are sometimes a little bit frustrating. I mean, I, I and, and and so like it's weird because they they posted on their React blog like, mm. hey, let's do this thing and let's talk about it, but then there was just no more discussion. Um. So yeah, everything you knew about React totally didn't change, but they said it was totally going to change. Right. Yeah. So we'll see. Um, I don't know when this would come out. Maybe it'll be. Maybe it won't even be React specific. Kind of like a Redux isn't React specific until you get the Redux connector. Right. Um. And maybe they'll make a general library and then make a React connector. So it'll be suspense React. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Who knows? We'll so, see. We'll see. It should be cool stuff though. Um. Looking forward to that though. Um. So briefly. I bought an S9 Plus. Nice. You, you, you guys got to see it just now. I, I didn't get a sh- chance to show Ian last night when I was at the at, at the play. Um, but it's a nice phone. Um, you know, it's very similar to the other one that I had, the S8 Plus. Nice. It seems like the big differences are the fingerprint sensor was moved on the back, and the camera can do variable apertures. Yeah, so about those features. So the camera being on the back now. So... You guys with your iPhone 10s, neither of you have an iPhone nope. 10 right now. Okay, nope. Just checking. So um, you can just look at your phone. That's cool. Yep. And I, I have that now, so I can just look at it and it'll unlock. It's great. Um, but the you, what do you guys have on the back of your phones? Like, is there anything in this general area or is your camera just up in the corner? Camera's up in the corner. corner. I, yeah. We both happen to have battery cases on right I now. See so that. there is a gigantic battery on the back. So like, what, what, what capacity is the built-in battery on those? Uh, not good enough. Uh, I think it's like 1,900 milliampere. Something along those lines. 1,900? Essentially not good enough. That's insane. And the this battery is... pack on the back also has about 1,900, I think. Oh. It's probably a little more than that, maybe. But Yeah, I don't know. And then my, my phone is getting old now, so it really dies a lot sooner than so, it used to. So you, this... Do you but, have a 7 now? Uh, I've had a 7 for yeah, a year and a half. That's right. We're, we're at, our phones are basically roughly so, so you're, the same. You're, you're, so you're coming up this season with iPhone. Yeah. what you're telling me. Okay. Basically. But it says my battery health is 86% and it has since the beginning of the 11.3 right. beta. And I'm same. like, hmm. Mm. Okay. So Feels this, like this yep, has yeah. a 3500 battery. Yeah. That's basically what so the it's, sum it's, of it's, these. It's a little yeah. bit less than double. Um, But my phone is like gigantic compared to those little toy phones and it probably uses more power when it's on too that's true it's surprisingly uh really good actually um i i had to do a lot of work yesterday to actually drain the battery all the way down nice like i had to intentionally play videos and make make it do stuff right does that does i don't know it doesn't drain um so one of the weird consequences of having the cameras where they are now and the fingerprint sensor where it is now on the back um, is that I don't know how to hold it. So previously, mm. the fingerprint sensor had <clears throat> been like adjacent, right next to the camera. Uh huh. Yeah. And and so that means this space here was just nothing. And so I could put my finger there and hold the phone up. But now I have to hold it a little lower, and I have to contort downwards a little bit. Right. And it's kind of weird. But you have the face unlock, so you're all good. Right? Well, I never actually use the fingerprint sensor. I always okay. do face unlock now. Good. Mm-hmm. How does that compare to the iPhone 10? In it's terms not of not as good, obviously. Security or anything? I don't know. It's inconvenience. Is it just using that camera? Yeah. Okay. Hmm. It's just it's just for convenience. It's not it's not secure. Okay. Um, but that's okay. Like if somebody wants to print out a full color picture of me, that's fine. It's free advertising. <laughs> True. Yeah. You have your Twitter bu- your uh, Twitter handle on your forehead. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um. So the full review of the S9 Plus, um, and uh, all of its many things that I've noticed since owning it for a couple of weeks. And by the time we record, it'll be probably a month. Um, that'll come soon on the Second Opinion with the uh, Ian R. Buck sometime in the future. Nice. Look forward to it. Yeah. So it'll be fun. So um, in a few days in this upcoming week, right. there is going to be an Apple event, which That's is true. weird because they announced WWDC and they don't normally do events between announcing and wwdc so lucky us yay <laughs> more stuff 
Yeah. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> sort of. Um, so this is an unusual one. They're not doing it on their campus or anywhere. It's that's... in Central Time. Yeah, it's it, it's in Chicago. At a high school. And it's sort of weird. So the initial rumors were for a refreshed education and or budget-minded MacBook Air. Uh, no, yeah. no. The new rumors are new iPads. Yeah, I would yeah. say a new budget iPad yeah. or even an ePad for education. Oh, no. Right. I, I... It would be really interesting if they brought back that old uh, E line. Yeah, oh, EMAC no. was super popular. Back I know. In the day. Yeah, it was. The they were they looked pretty awesome too. To the point where like I knew people who would like buy old ones and use them. I had an old one till I gave it away to some guy on Craigslist. Right. Exactly. Like a year and a half ago. Hmm. Yep. So I would have preferred new MacBook Airs because the man that product is no the they need, just, the MacBook Air line needs to be done and they no. need to reduce the price of the MacBook. No, I think no, no, <laughs> nope. Mm-hmm. They, I think they I think they need to and make the, the MacBook Air like they're gonna drop the Air from the name. Yeah, but they need to have something like the yeah. MacBook Air, but but where does that but it, uh, but it's weird because it doesn't fit in that line, right? Because the the lowest end MacBook Pro is the same CPU level as the MacBook Air is today. Right. However, the MacBook Air actually has ports on it. True. Yeah. And so it's... <laughs> so Apple has no clue how to fit it into their lineup because it's impossible. And that keyboard needs a little love too, I think. The so keyboard's yeah. fine. There's... I don't know. There's just... It's a weird time for MacBooks, I think. Right. But yeah. I think I think probably if Apple were to keep the ports on anything, it feels like they would be more open to that on an education product maybe yeah possibly I, yeah yeah i'd see that because mm-hmm. you know i mean they you know they make some kind of you know maybe the charitable way to put it is uh future looking or forward forward looking decisions about things like consumer products mm-hmm. but um they also recognize why they have the reputation they do on education products so i think that they probably in talking to people they're like well you know I'd be interested in still buying Macs, but I'm not going to get 37 million, uh, you know, USB Type C dongles for everything. Not because to mention, why would I do that? If they did that for education, the children would lose them instantly. Exactly. Right. 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 It's, you know. Yep. Throw them all over the place. But, and put but them I think smoothies. a lot of education is doing iPads or Chromebooks now because they're so much cheaper. Yeah. So I don't know. Having a cheap MacBook Air, I don't know if it would really do enough to. Well, so like I don't I don't know what models of Chromebooks schools are buying, but you know if the Chromebook they're buying is three hundred dollars, that sounds about fair, right? Yeah. yeah. So if it's three hundred dollars, but it can't actually edit video, or it can't actually, you know, hold any amount of local storage, right? Yeah. Um, for for whatever purpose, um, you know, maybe maybe a eight hundred dollar MacBook Air would actually just be better. Yeah. Yeah. But that's fair. The the cheapest iPad, which is right now three twenty nine, I think they made a version that's just three hundred even. I think that's that little bit of price reduction. Well, I mean, that iPad can do video editing. It can to do me, audio that doesn't editing. sound like a uh, that doesn't sound like a new iPad. It just sounds like a education discount. Yeah, but maybe they do that and update the iPad a little bit. Yeah, I don't know. That's that's kind of what I could see. Mm-hmm. And maybe they're gonna push some new education features of iOS. Right. I was gonna say maybe they maybe eleven point four or maybe it's a separate like more guided, almost like Sugar. Do you guys remember Sugar? Mm -mm. Okay. Um, I'll put I'll put a link in the show notes. But Sugar is like this very guided education focused OS Mm. that was based on Fedora. Um, I'm pretty sure nobody remembers that. (laughs) Oh man. Um, (laughs) I don't think there's any huge education features in iOS eleven point three. But it's about time where they release it. They've had six or seven betas now. Mm-hmm. So I feel like that might line up with it. We're also due for the iPhone SE 2 if they're going to do that. So I but it doesn't really make sense to do it at the education They event. wouldn't do it here. They would have to do that at the um, WWC or just keep it for fall at this point. They kind of lost their window of opportunity for that. Yeah. I hope if they do an SE, though, an SE 2, that's funny. Um, I hope if they do that, it follows the same design language as the iPhone 10 totally because mm-hmm. I know it won't and Notch. so that's why I'm hoping that it will um, but otherwise then you'll be forced to design apps for another 10 years right. that follow the old format right right um, so uh, WWDC uh, speculation on that uh, allegedly coming on June 4th yeah 
That sounds it's like not fun. really alleged. It's pretty pretty certain. Yeah, it seems like a lot of people who usually get tickets did not get tickets this year, which mm. is kind of sad. It's almost like that random drawing isn't maybe random. Yeah, but you never know. But hopefully that means that cool new people will be able to go. Yeah. Um, that that would be fun. Mm-hmm. I d- I did not apply because uh. I, I don't really want to go back to San Francisco. <laughs> I did not apply because that's a lot of money, and yeah, I don't really right. do iOS development. I mean, how much is it now? Like fifteen hundred, sixteen hundred, yeah, sixteen yeah. hundred plus hotel and airfare. Well, it's yeah. like a which is going to be two, it's like a two grand flat, three thousand dollar a week. week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's crazy. Yep, I could just not go. Yeah, right. You get all the videos. Yeah, uh, I feel like you're better off if you're a big iOS shop that you a lot the week in a conference room and watch all the videos yeah. that host them. I think that actually is a much better plan. And just think about how much cheaper that is too for for the company as well. Yeah. Like yeah. sure you have to pay the people to not work on a project, but you can just get them pizza. Pizza's cheaper yeah. than it's a lot cheaper than getting plane a couple tickets, people. cars, yeah. rentals, hotel stays. Yeah. Yeah. Just mm, pizza. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um <laughs> Yeah, yeah. WWDC is gonna be interesting this year. So they um do do we think that there's going to be any kind of good hardware coming out of that one? I'm hoping a new iMac with the six core. Didn't they so. say something about a new MacBook Pro too? Or? I mean, we we can all dream. That's they have uh, a yeah, new patent for the keyboard that doesn't have the, or that's all a touchscreen. Yeah, I don't think that would be now. Yeah, that's no. got to be like a couple years out. If, oh, if totally. people are already raging at them for not being able to handle some dust under keys, yeah, I mean they they can't do it right now. Yeah, yeah. and their new what is it, micro LED display technology that they're building? That'd be pretty so fun. So they can then just say, hey, uh, the, manufacturer, make this. And yeah. Here's all the specs. And- mm-hmm. So I also wonder if, the, I, I, I mean, I feel like that's for the watch, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah they'll probably start with that. Because that's a nice small screen to yeah. start with. Tiny, repeatable. Low yield. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so what do we think about um, any other uh, iOS or macOS features they might talk about maybe? Well, there's the new, what's the framework called? Um, Marzipan. The the combo of the you know UI kit and app kit, mm-hmm. where you can write much more similar UI logic for both That's OSs. Right. I forgot. I about think that. that'll be that. I don't know if that will be this year or the year after, but I think that's coming up. Right. That will have interesting impacts on React Native too. I feel mm-hmm. like. Wouldn't it be great if you could actually make a Mac app in React Native? I would prefer making a, a, a Mac app in React Native to making it with Electron. Oh, well, yeah. By far. Yeah. I, it's it's interesting to me that there hasn't been a bigger movement in that space right now. Right. Like, because, I mean, they could almost just bootstrap it on top of Electron, and I don't know why they didn't. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, some would say they wouldn't even need to. Right. right? It's probably be even simpler to just i mean maybe the biggest thing is that they don't have um you know all all of the native ui bindings Mm -hmm. are for uh for ios or for app kit um no wait not app kit ui kit yeah jeepers (laughs) it's close enough i mean it's just two three two to three letters different yeah right 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 what's the you know lexicographic distance on that or lexicographic distance on that who knows um but i feel like with something like marzipan it would be um, almost like a no-brainer if they already have to support that or have to quote unquote have to right if they already have the option to support it it'd be even easier so like I'm hoping I'm hoping we get I'm hoping we get that new MacBook Pro yeah but I'm right. not too I don't I don't like I'm not going to be so disappointed if it doesn't happen but man right. I sure hope it does I mean if if there's a new Mac Mini even oh. that's uh yeah or a new Mac Pro I think maybe that's what I was thinking of the new Mac Pro is the See, I feel like they'd hold that for the end of the year because, like, they that's need fair. they need every single hour of time. Yeah, that's true. I'm holding off for the iMac because that's what I'm looking to buy, um, yes. and then I'll keep using my 2012 MacBook Pro until it totally dies. Mm-hmm. I'll probably get a MacBook again a year after I get the iMac. I don't know. I'm yeah. fine with desktop and iPad life. I I can't work on an iPad, so I need a MacBook Pro. <laughs> I don't. So, so, I don't work any much at home anymore. So I was. I was using this computer, and I. Yep. I was doing this for some reason. <laughs> you know, just 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 turning it on its side. You know, yeah. for whatever reason. And then something inside of the fan started clicking a little bit. Yeah, and I didn't like the sound of that. Oh no! Some dust. You got to open it up and pull out dust with tweezers. I'm, I'm good. I do that every year or two. That sounds risky. Yeah, That's I think fine. Ryan, you might have encountered the latent feature 
of uh of his MacBook Pros, oh. otherwise known as Gravity. <laughs> uh uh but uh it's asymmetrical fan blades. Yes. But it's not asymmetrical by design, it's asymmetrical <laughs> in other ways. Yeah. Uh, I've had a MacBook that did a similar thing. <laughs> Yeah, um, and of course, I was running Expo, or, oh, yeah. or the simulator, when it was happening, so I'm so like, So it needs hmm, the fan. Yeah, let's, let's, oh, something bad's happening. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm hoping for that. Um, I also hope they, um, I hope they rearrange, like, their the lineups of all the things, like, just make them not be, like, 25 products in every single line. I yeah. feel like, yeah, they're they're keeping old stuff around a lot more than they used to, Yeah, like, I know Tim ago. loves doing that. Yeah. But, stop it. They still sell the 11 inch MacBook Air to education. I can't believe that. That sh- that thing should go away. This is very true. The 13 inch MacBook Air is good. Even the 2015 MacBook Pros, they're two and a half years old now. It, that seems a little ridiculous okay, to me, too. Okay. However, now I work with two companies yep. daily that buy those. And the reason they buy those is because nobody really wants to pay the extra $700 right. for the inferior product. Yeah, but the thing is, if Apple didn't sell them, they could make a lot more money, I think. Yes, but then they would also have a lot more angry enterprise customers. That yeah, that's true. Significantly, very bitterly angry. I don't know. I feel like that they're, whole line. They're could angry have been anyway, though, right? Oh, well, they're kind they're of. they're enterprise angry. Yeah, not yeah, bitterly yeah. angry. That's true. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. So we'll see. Um. June fourth is coming up. You know, it's just like two months away. This is almost. true. Oh, geez, coming up fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, speaking of uh, enterprise features, uh, <laughs> there's a really cool, uh, our, our, our last kind of news item for this week uh, has to do with pattern matching. Uh, this is so cool. O- otherwise known as regular expressions. No. Um, <laughs> this is like if a language had regular expressions as part of its syntax. Exactly. No, that's not what it's like. No, I'm messing with you. So if you've ever used... Um, an ag- ML family an, language. Yeah, yeah, an ML family language. I'm trying to think of a non-ML family language. What's an ML family language? Um, an ML family language is a language that follows the pattern set forth in the ML yeah. family pattern. Stuff like OCaml, F Sharp, Elm. Um, Elm. Appa- apparently, so Rust is sort of functional things. Yep, but gotcha. but not but not Haskell functional, yeah. not Erlang functional. I don't know anything about functional languages, so... Turns out nobody does either. Yeah. <laughs> I just use whatever features propagate their way into JavaScript. Is, is functional well, programming in this pattern? feature will change everything. <laughs> Truly. Um, so one of the things that people have always loved... Um, so I, I'm a big ML advocate. Um, and so one of the guys that works, that made React, was originally trying to make sort of an ML style language, yeah. reason ML. Yep. And so, but he wanted a JavaScript, and so he just kind of made React first and then figured out how to do the real ml stuff later yep and one of the things that ocaml has and ml has is this idea of pattern matching yep and so ml has functional pattern matching which is maybe a little bit different but this is just like value pattern matching yep so it's kind of like a advanced switch statement so switch you can kind of give a single value and then the cases are states of that value yep a match is sort of like you give it a value and then you can have expressions that can evaluate well, is this expression successful? Yep. Cool. Let's do this body. Is this expression successful? Cool. Let's do this body and so on. And it's really nice and good. And let's 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 implement this as soon as possible into the spec. Truly. There is a npm package yes. um that gives you kind of a uh a preview of um what that might look like but it's it's very proof of concepty mm-hmm. so um you know the syntax is not quite um the same as what's set out in the proposal but um you know it, it's really awesome i'm excited for for when this uh gets in place because um i love doing this sort of thing and um you know there, there are certain projects or certain situations in certain projects where i uh have actually built something not to sim- not dissimilar from this um not necessarily in the sense that it um you know the the keys are expressions and the values are are results but you know it's essentially um for anonymous functions Mm -hmm. and each anonymous function takes an object that's assumed to be in a particular state um and you have to do a checking elsewhere to figure out whether it's in that state or not um and the result you know i i really like that pattern i like those patterns a lot so yeah and i i I don't. I didn't really use it much in Rust, but right. um, I know it's available in Rust, and it's 
which re- reminded me, of course, of SML. Yep. Um, it's just so nice. Um, it would be it would be great to get this feature in, and then of course get the functional pattern matching in. Yeah. Which is where you define different argument patterns, and then the arguments will change which body actually gets, ends up getting executed. Yep. What's harder about that in JavaScript is we don't have types, so maybe this not. Let's not do that. This is true. Um, yeah. So I think there's there's a ton of unanswered questions here. So like, how do they deal with all the type differences and yep. you know, magic? Like, what if there's an async branch but there's not another branch that's async? Like, right. what does that mean? Yep. Um, what if there's a generator in one of them? I don't know. Like, there's so so many so many weird things that they have to think about. Right. Um. So we'll see. Truly, should be. It looks stuff, interesting. Though. I'm I'm thinking of, you know, if I have a function that takes in a date and I can either pass in a date that I or as a string that I parse into a date or a date object itself, I can yeah. just match on string or date. Right. And then mm-hmm. do whatever. Yep. Like, yep. Rather than if statements, just match it. Yeah. Match statements. Oh, no. It's it's pretty, like, readable, I feel yeah. like. And as opposed to having, like, if, mm-hmm. you know, type of equals string, type of yep. equals object, type well, of equals... The what, what I think about yeah. um, as a cool example is sort of if we if we imagine that React suspense never comes to fruition for whatever reason. Right. One way to simplify that loading state logic mm-hmm. is to have your loading state state and then, you know, loading thing. Yep. And then you put it in a match statement like this yep. and you just call a different chunk of your render function yep. in this match and problem solved. That's exactly the case that I've used it for on yeah. projects that I've used. Mm. It's the remote data pattern as we call it in elm yeah it makes perfect sense i mean that it, it feels i mean that's kind of what one of their examples is and it? it's yep. like you've got a 200 error you've got a 400 error you've got a 500 error mm-hmm. deal with it yep deal with it yeah all righty so i think that concludes the uh kind of news and updates section it's time for everyone's favorite segment new twitter followees we need to have some uh, audio That's, clip that we, we play do. where everyone if, says, new if, Twitter follow me. If, if, if we make it, I'll put it in. Nice. Um, so, yeah, you you go ahead, Brandon. Uh, so I, I've got a, a great a great group of three uh, people who I followed on Twitter in the time since our previous podcast. Uh, the first is uh, Jason Langsdorf, who is, uh, a, as you might imagine, a, a general uh, software-y person. Um uh, he also lists himself as a mediocre bartender, but uh, that's kind of neither neither here nor there, is it? Um, he uh, the the reason why I followed him and the reason why I think he's a good follow for uh, this group is because he's uh, kind of in the GraphQL space, which I think is something that is uh, kind of interesting to uh, interesting to keep an eye on. Um, particularly, I believe he had he had a post that I found really helpful about. Uh, well, I can't track it down now, but he's a good dude. So there you go. Uh, the second Twitter follower I have is uh, Thimbleweed Park. Uh, have, you, have you all ever heard of Thing- Thimbleweed Park before? Mm-mm. It's a point-and-click adventure game uh, made by folks who have been doing point-and-click adventure games for since like the dawn of point-and-click adventure games. Um, it's really, really good. Um, and not only is it like an awesome game and really fun to play through, um, it kind of takes you through this like world... Um, that's kind of like set in the 80s right kind of like a um x files or uh the uh john gruber um <laughs> x files or what's the other one twin peaks kind of scenario um but they also have a really awesome blog that talks you through how they built it hmm. um hmm. so it's you know available for you know all the game systems that you might want to they play games on PC, Mac, Linux, iOS, Android, Switch, Xbox One, and PlayStation 4. Oh, yep. that's every computer that's, I've ever heard all of. of them. Yep, yep. And uh, it's it's just, it's really good. It's really well done. It's, it's won, won a lot of awards. Not that you necessarily, you know, need to win awards for a thing to be good. Um, but the blog is really kind of where it's at because you can see a lot of the, the patterns. I think um, one of the folks... Uh, behind this actually literally wrote a book about doing point and click adventure games that's fun um it's yeah there's like uh th- he has this really awesome idea that i was talking with a friend of the show max Fierke about uh which is a, a puzzle dependency chart so like mm-hmm. it's a way that you can like graph out um 
how what what things you might need to do in order and yeah. what things you might not need to do in order. Mm-hmm. And that's um, critical in a game like this. That's critical in a game like this, but simultaneously too, like I've brought that to work, right? Like mm-hmm. it's it's really awesome for even like it's you know take out the puzzle part maybe, and it's just a dependency chart, which is you know. Um, a really great way to map out how you you know at what point do you have the data you need to do things yep um so yeah that's it's good stuff uh oh apparently they're working on an android port i don't know whether they already have it looks like they already have it so never mind <laughs> there you go that's the weed part for you hmm. uh and then last but not least uh is uh somebody who goes by the name risky business on twitter uh, i don't know if we've talked about this uh uh these folks before um so patrick Gray is uh, the name of the person behind it, uh, and the uh, Risky Business is the name of their security podcast. So it's like an infosec kind of uh, kind of deal. Uh, it was recommended to be by a coworker, and it is uh, it's pretty awesome. It's uh, one of those brave people that want to have a .dot biz domain, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, I've been uh, listening to this podcast for no, you recommended it to me? me. So okay. I think I've just now. We've come full circle. You <laughs> recommended the podcast to me. I listened to the podcast. I followed the the guy behind it on Twitter. There we go. And now I have recommended it as a, as a Twitter followee. So you yeah. may I've you listened may well to this have for before. a year now. I think. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it's a great podcast. Learned a lot about it or about everything and totally. They usually do like a news section <laughs> for the first half hour. Yep. And then um, fe- uh, featured interview and a sponsored sponsored interview. Yeah right on yeah good show highly recommend it good stuff all right i followed uh a few people first one is chloe condon a cool person to follow on twitter um i don't know i'm just kind of trying to get more people who aren't just in one sphere that i follow on twitter she's a uh, developer evangelist at get century which yeah. is century nice we talked about that yeah again full They're circle, full circle. It's all, yeah. uh, <laughs> time time is a flat circle it's a closed loop. Uh, something, something, Inception. <laughs> I also followed the Amy Code. Um, I think she works on Kubernetes stuff. I nice. don't know. Yeah. She posts some YouTube videos I've watched a couple of about her experience with stuff. And then uh, maybe Katz, who works at NPM. Uh, they're behind the uh, node module for the pattern matching yeah. proposal, too. I saw... I saw a lot of tweets about that. And yeah, I don't know. New stuff. And I need to unfollow other people because my timeline's getting too busy again. <laughs> Unheard of. It's that time. But I'm looking through my timeline thinking, oh, who who tweets a lot who I can't follow or who I don't need to follow anymore? <laughs> and then it's just like, well, I just followed them. I shouldn't unfollow them right away. Right. And then it's like, well, this friend tweets a lot of things and then maybe I'll meet them for another week. And then I'm like, oh. I getcha. So I'm reading one of the commit messages that she posted a screenshot of. Docs, syntax, bike sheds are joyless pits of despair. This is true. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> Which, of course, is in reference to the pattern matching. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, they, um, I don't know where, where it went, but I had a link to um, a rewrite of that readme file yeah. that we looked at. Yep. Um, that went into a, even more detail yeah. of everything. <laughs> yep. It's good stuff. Yeah. It's good stuff. And uh, doesn't TC39 meets soon? Yeah, so that or was be that the time this week? Or was that next to discuss week? Discuss it. Let's I see. I don't know. They meet all the time, and I can never keep track. Right. It's like which which. I feel like that was actually this meeting. last week. <laughs> Maybe I don't know. Let's find out. Twenty eighteen oh five no oh three. So the March meeting of TC39 uh, was last week. Cool. Okay. I feel like that's where the match stuff started. It yeah, probably was. Yeah. Right, because I saw something. Uh, I forget who it was on Twitter or any of the contacts, but they were talking about something, and they're like, "eh, this could be improved a little bit." So someone just like huddles down for five minutes and writes 150 lines of code saying, "Here, how's this?" And yeah. I was like, "There we go, perfect." <laughs> that's how it goes on on Twitter. Yeah. And 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 I, and, you know, as I as I expand the people that i follow from the original group which of course started kind of with dan and and his friends you know it's so intriguing to see like how they're all connected and and they're all linked together right by these like pseudo acquaintance friendship things yeah like you don't really know how they know each other but man they do somehow (laughs) clearly they yeah yeah it's weird and i'm happy to report that i did not follow anybody in the past month 
<laughs> so I, I did it. My my nice. t- my Twitter followers have stayed constant. That's all right. I followed like six dozen people. Uh, <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> I'm I'm up to three thousand two hundred sixty-seven oh followers. I I just looked at what I was. At doing. what point will Twitter think you're a bot? Oh, I'm pretty sure that's we're past that. <laughs> I follow. Oh no, those are followers. Uh, I follow three fifty seven. Nice. I think I'm at four seventy eight, but I'd I'd love to be under four hundred. But I don't know if that's gonna happen. I unfollowed a bunch of people who I knew in high school and stuff who never tweet anymore. So I'm like, why should I follow them? But right. But what if they do suddenly? Yeah, that's the thing. But also, if I mean, if it's been six years since they've tweeted, they're probably not right. going to again. But what if they do? But also, all that does is lowers my Twitter follow number. It doesn't lower the amount of tweets i see yeah right yeah i don't know like it'd be cool if there were some twitter based twitter tool to help you determine whether people are still active on twitter yeah and Mm -hmm. whether they're you know like if there was a cool way to see like hey look these people kind of fit into this group you would you like to not follow them now (laughs) of course that wouldn't help twitter in any way just create some app and then we'll get all the data yeah right and then all your friends data yeah and then and yeah. then and sell then it sell... for political reasons. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like we might be trying to talk about something, but we're not. Yeah. Um, come back next episode. <laughs> truly, truly. Well, this is fun. We'll do it again uh, next time. Next time. Yeah. So in June, <laughs> maybe uh, sooner than June. Probably sooner. Than April. June. I'm I'm going to be out of the country from April sixth through eighteenth. So nice. sometime after I get back. That's I think. perfect. And then it'll be May, and then it'll be June. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we've been keeping up this monthly thing for a while. Now. Yeah, it's been it's good. Been pretty solid. M- monthly, give or take a week. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Plus or minus. That's fine. Yeah, we, that sounds good. We are a week later now, or 10 days later now than we were a little while ago. That's, but. that's true. You know, it's, it's it was winter, and there was snow every other day. This is and, true. you know. I, I, was, I was out of the country for a while last week. Right. And then before that, you were just out of your mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was there's lots, of, lots of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of stuff. So, it, you know, I was going to say it's a busy time of year. No, it's always busy. This is true. That's yeah. the thing about busy times of year. They, yeah. I feel like every time is busy time. I, I, yeah, I know. expand to encompass everything. Yep. It, it, it's getting it's getting there. Yep. I like that all the time. Um, so where can we find you guys on the internet? Uh, you can find me at uh, a, a lot of places, but not the least of which on Twitter, where I'm Brandon underscore MN. You can also use that to uh, follow my coffee adventures uh on on instagram or rather my adventures as i try to drink less coffee um <laughs> take your pick who knows i'm not 100 percent sure about that i loved your um twitter rendition of you when you didn't have enough coffee yeah yeah it's, it's just about right it's like the spongebob meme where uh yeah with the letters yeah that was um, good yeah that was uh yeah was a weird weird day but that's that's probably the best spot you can find me <laughs> uh you can find me on twitter at uh brian mitch l and my website, brianm.me, where I've now upgraded to, uh, what was it? UI Kit 3 Beta 40 nice. from Beta, beta 31. 40. And uh, Font Awesome 5 from Font Awesome 4. Mm. Now I'm using loading it with JavaScript, and it replaces things with SVGs. And nice. Doesn't zoom with the text anymore, but whatever. <laughs> so it goes. Yeah, that's me. And of course, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter at RyanMR, and of course, on my website, ryanrampersite.com. Sweet. And you can find show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash pk37. Cool. We didn't even do that substitution there. That's good. I'm glad you do it. <laughs> I can. I got that mental substitution. Yeah, Whoa. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. That's really good. At pk dollar sign episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, have a good one. Till next month. See ya.